Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Paul went to the, our team and he said, can you get us somebody here that's completely holistic on global shipping, that can understand a, where's, where's Maersk, Copenhagen? I think Denmark, yeah, I can't yeah, even remember. Yeah. From the Baltic Sea over to Sri Lanka through Singapore, all these geographies are around and there has to be somebody who's encyclopedic on global shipping in the many geographies. John Cartsonis fits the bill, not only with his work at Citigroup uh, years ago, but with Breakwave Advisors. He's a board member with Synergy uh, as well. He's encyclopedic on shipping. What are the people doing, John? Thank you so much, first of all, for being with us on short notice. What is Maersk doing this morning? What do the people in the shipping business do when they have a horrific event like this? Good morning and thank you for having me. Yes, indeed, that's a horrific event. And I think like uh, from a shipping perspective, the first thing you have to do is obviously find what went wrong, right? I mean, um, these are uh, state of the art ships, especially this one uh, involved in this accident is a, is a brand new ship. It's less than 10 years old, built in Korea. These are high quality uh, ships. So it's, uh, it's, a very, it's a very unlikely phenomenon that you get something like that. Um, the other thing is obviously you have to look at the human error, but again, when the ships approach ports or tight waterways or areas that they don't know very well, you have uh, experienced personnel that gets on board from the port called um, basically pilots. And they are the ones who are gonna right. steer the ship uh, through the waterway. So uh, there are a lot of elements here. One is obviously uh, the human element. The other is the, the mechanical failure, which seems to be the case here. Um, right. But it's also obviously the timing here, because this, you know, if it happened like 10 or 15 minutes later, nothing would have gone wrong. Is the process here in the coming quarters, in months, in years, a litigious years in the making process? Or is it covered by insurance and reinsurance and offices in Hamilton, Bermuda, that I don't know about, where there's almost a routine to how the shipping industry deals with a tragedy like this? Well, I don't think it's routine at all. I mean, usually human laws, uh, and hopefully there is none here, but uh, human laws, especially outside uh, the ship, uh, is kind that is very rare in the maritime industry. You have very few incidents globally that you have basically this type of uh, uh, an event that will cause uh, basically uh, ordinary citizens to, uh, you know, to, to die. So I think that's uh, definitely not an ordinary process. It will take uh, a very, very long time and it will have uh, multiple um, uh, you know, multiple agents, organizations involved, especially given that this, uh, this happened in the U.S. John, can you give us a sense just for folks that you know not in this business, like at 1.30 in the morning, go, navigating through a harbor, is this navigation visual? Is it by instruments? H how is that done? Because it seemed like it was significantly perhaps, you know, off course here. Yeah, of course, it's not visual, obviously. These are, uh, as I said at the beginning, state-of-the-art equipment on board and very experienced pilots and uh, captains that are going to steer the ship uh, outside, you know, to go towards the ocean. So, um, as we all saw in the videos, it seems that there's a blackout happening just uh, moments before the collision. Okay. So, um, again, we don't know what was happening at that point on the bridge, what people were discussing, what was um the incident but it seems that uh, a blackout where basically everything stops the engine stops there is no power and there is no way you can steer the boat uh, the ship away from um, uh, either currents or maybe the, the, the router got stuck who knows but uh it seems that the mechanical failure is the most likely scenario here john just give us a sense how big baltimore is in the in the global scale of shipping it seems like a busy port um just give us a sense of its relative scale 
Uh, it is very significant um, in terms especially of uh, consumer goods, uh, cars, uh, stuff that the U.S. imports from abo uh, abroad uh, is not uh, as significant in the commodities business. I mean, they do export uh, coal from the Baltimore um, area. But I think like uh, right. probably what's going to be affected most is like uh, deliveries of new cars, for example, or consumer goods. But again, I mean, there is a lot of uh, other areas, obviously north, the New, the new York Harbor, uh, and all the way right. down to Georgia, Savannah, and so on, so that you have alternative uh, destinations. Um, but obviously, that's going to take uh, a while for the situation to resolve and this thing to uh, b begin operating normally again. So right. definitely, these delays will cause um, delays in deliveries of goods. If you're joining us now worldwide and across this nation as we look at a horrific bridge accident in Baltimore, John Katsonis joins us now, managing partner, Breakaway Advisors, his work with Synergy, his work with Citigroup over the years, just truly encyclopedic on the linkage of global shipping uh, into equity analysis. John, um, I, I think a question that a lot of Americans have today that needs to be reviewed it seems like everybody in America is involved in shipping. Maersk is over in the Baltic Sea. You and your board membership with Synergy, they're out of Athens, Greece. Okay, I get that. Breakwave is its own beast. Why aren't Americans involved? Why aren't there American ships, U.S. ships, U.S. shipping, U.S. shipbuilding? Why is America left out of the discussion? Huh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, and it goes back to, I think, that what everybody knows that is cheaper and um, more efficient to build it uh, abroad uh, or to, to staff it abroad. I mean, this is something that has gone through, you know, decades now. Uh, the U.S. maritime business, if you go back 100, 150 years, was thriving. But this has changed over the years. And right now, basically, Asia and, uh, you know, some European countries are dominating the, the global shipping space. Um, you know, it has to do with cost. It has to do with uh, the cost right. of building a ship. I mean, you can build a ship in, in the U.S., but it's going to cost you three times right. more because of, like, uh, okay. the protectionism that the shipping industry is enjoying in the U.S. So, um Right. You know, that's that's the main reason for that. Just 30 seconds left, John. Totally unfair question. But you're <laughs> I mean, you're an ex former ex analyst at Citigroup. I mean, right. He's used to it. John, when does the Baltimore Harbor open up again? And you're just guess here in the moments of this tragedy. When would you see free sailing down the river towards the Chesapeake Bay again? Um, I would say not this year. If I was to take wow. a, a, yeah. I would take a, a wild guess here. John, yep. thank you so much. And short notice, thanks to our team, Eric Mullen, and everybody for getting uh, just such an authority. John Carsonis with yeah, us, that was a good guest. Uh, with yep. Breakwave Advisors here with some real pro perspective there on this tragedy. <music> Joining us from the Peterson Institute, Adam Posen. Uh, here on the state. Adam, I love the beginning of the interview with Robert Armstrong, and you say something that's on the edge of Robert Thaler out at, uh, 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 out at Chicago, uh, Richard Thaler, excuse me, and that you say you underestimated the resiliency of the people of the American and global economy. Discuss how you fold a character, a culture, a fabric of people into economics. Thank you, Tom, for reading and having me back. It's great to be with you on this. And I'm grateful to Robert and the FT for taking me through all that. I think you what we have to think about is going into the pandemic, there was panic, there was reason for fear. We didn't know what was going to happen. And we have in the US in particular, this enormous spike in unemployment. And rightly, the Fed and the first the Trump and then the Biden administration started providing some social benefits, some health care, all things I supported. But what was amazing and became evident within the first few months was that people adapted. They, they set up new businesses. They moved to new jobs. They arranged care. That doesn't mean we should leave them to that. It's better that we didn't. But we, as economists, and particularly people who are on the progressive side where I sort of am, you know, we, we, we understandably worry a lot about people buffeted by large shocks that they have no fault in and they can't control. But what I think COVID showed us is people's 
ability to adapt to these shocks is much bigger than we worried about. And that leads into all kinds of positive, though not intended, labor market changes in the U.S. that I think came out of this process. One of the things, Adam, I think folks are concerned about is the economic divide in this country may have been even exacerbated from even prior levels by this pandemic, uh, just simply, you know, as it could be as simple as some people can afford to work from home, some jobs yeah. you can't do that. How big of a concern is that for you? I mean, Paul, you're absolutely right. And, and I mean, it's, it doesn't get much more basic and important than what you said, that, that people of different levels of income, different levels of wealth, particularly in the US, have different vulnerabilities. Nonetheless, um, it's more about let's call it the health gradient than the economic gradient over the last few years. So what we've seen is people who didn't have good health care, people who had pre-existing conditions, which is associated with socioeconomic status, people who had less access to medicine, and people, unfortunately, who were less educated and more willing to believe lies and fears about vaccinations, they had much worse health outcomes, much higher mortality and morbidity, as they say. But on the economics, what we've seen for the last few years is we've actually seen a closing of the income inequality. We've seen much more growth in real income for the lower end of the income distribution than for the higher end. And again, I don't think, I certainly right. didn't, I don't think anybody else was expecting that going in. When, when you look at, uh, and Adam, we're running out of time here with the news flow out of Baltimore this morning. I want to get you back really soon here on more yes. Adam Post and economics. But just as a general <laughs> statement, do you buy the new productivity? And is it just simply total factor productivity, the oddities of technology over on the right side of the equation? I, Tom, I am reluctantly a productivity bull. I, I think it's a productivity two-step. The first is what we've seen for the last year and are seeing still is this labor market transition where millions of lower income workers were more willing to take risks and have more of a sense of backstop and are moving on large numbers to bigger employers and becoming more productive. And I think that's what we're benefiting from. I think we're at the start of a boom created by generative AI. You've had many guests. I know you've been talking about this way early, Tom. Um, we don't know when that's going to hit. We don't know how All big right. it's going to hit, but it's pretty certain it's coming. Adam, thank you so much. Way too short a visit. We'll have Dr. Posen on again here uh, more than soon. It's tough to get him. He's busy, but we'll try to get him on here with the news flow today. In our studios now is someone who knows we rip up the script. Regularly. We can do this with Peter Shear. Of Academy Securities, Bloomberg News, Peter, moments ago reporting. I'm going to read it verbatim because I really have not dived into a lengthy article. Apple, iPhone shipments in China, fell about 33% in February from a year earlier. This according to official data. I guess it's part of the China mix here, which you are expert on. The export-import of America to China, from China to Amer uh, America. Is it anything like we knew, or is it a whole new world after all? I think it's a very new world. And I think people are a little bit dismissive in saying, well, sales right now for some companies in China are s slower because the Chinese economy is slowing. Yes, that is true. But I think that's far more than that. What we see China doing is repressing sales of Western brands in China, whether they're telling certain agencies that they can't use the sorts of phones, whether they're putting outright bans. So the one thing they're trying to do is suppress sales of Western brands in China to elevate Chinese sales. And I think they're also trying to do that globally. They're pushing in emerging markets. They have companies like Shine and Timu who are really aggressively competing on price with U.S. brands. And I think people are being a little bit too dismissive and saying, oh, this is just weakness in China. I think this is an attempt by China to replace our brands with their brands domestically and pushing globally, which will not be good for valuations of U.S. stocks. From your perspective, I'm looking at your research here, what is the difference between made in China versus made by China? So traditionally, right, we took, you know, Western companies took our products, made them in China, and then we took and tried to sell those products globally. So they were really our products, okay. but they happen to be made in China. So to me, the difference is China's having difficulty attracting 
people to manufacture in there. So if they're going to do manufacturing, they have to manufacture their own brands and sell theirs. So that's why I think it's more of a made by China, because you're going to start seeing BYD much more frequently, Huawei, these companies you've never heard of, whether it's through Shine or Timo, Timu. Sorry. And I think that's why I'm calling it made by China, because they've been making all the goods for a long time, but it was largely them making our goods. I think they're now more aggressively trying to develop their own brands, sell those, and that will lead into market share. It will cut profit because yep. they are going to compete on price. So. I, you know, I think about these companies, I mean, Tim Cook, I think as we speak, is in China. We see Western CEOs making that seemingly weekly, monthly pilgrimage to China, yet we do, in fact, appear to have some type of technological cold war between China and the West. What does Apple do? What does Tesla do? I mean, some of these companies are really intertwined with China. Yeah, and so at Academy Securities, as Tom knows, we've got 18 retired generals and admirals who yep. serve as our geopolitical intelligence group. I would say I'm seeing a disconnect where a lot of corporations are still trying to figure <clears throat> out, okay, how do we work with China? How do we sell into China, right? That's yep. still the brand. And everything we're hearing at a national security level, it is all about China. It is completely bipartisan. It doesn't matter which party, the people who are in charge of national security. And uh, CISO, which puts out a lot of bulletins on um, cyber warfare and mm -hmm. cyber attacks. They came out with, you know, really a big warning on this Typhoon Volt, which they clearly label as the People Republic of China's Communist Party, their hackers working on their behalf, trying to infiltrate U.S. infrastructure. So this is not going to get better. This is going to get worse as these, you know, you see an entity like that very willing to publicly comment okay. and not just say state actors. So, you know, I've never asked this question before. There's always a first. What does it mean for NVIDIA? I, I mean, I just, all of our audience is glued into growth stocks, quality. Lizanne Saunders off on yesterday with Schwab talking about quality. Are you saying exit the glorified stocks of the moment? You know, I, I do think some of, we may be peak AI in this particular cycle where, um, you know, I was mentioning earlier that all of a sudden teeth brushes now have AI components or something like right. that. So I think everyone's kind of latching on to this. Um, we've got one of their generals who's been very good. He helps advise DC on AI in particular. And we see AI developing into four worlds. We've got what's going on in the US, which we think is very healthy. It's growing. It's going to be a big part of our economy. It right. might be overdone. You've got Europe, where I think AI is going to stagnate because they have so much data restriction. So Europe's not going to be competitive in AI. You've got India, which is actually a rising place, and you're seeing places like NVIDIA invest there, so I think that'll be exciting. And China is marching to the beat of their own drum. They have a very strong AI plan. They're one directional. If they get right. it right, it could be dangerous. If they get it wrong, we have hope. But that, to me, there is no right. work for NVIDIA or U.S. companies in China. That is getting separated. Peter, yep. we have major, major breaking news. You can stay with us and take this in. I'm sure it'll fold into your report. Uh, this morning, Peter Chair, Academy Securities News. With a difficult news flow, we're going to try to make light of it, and only Lisa Mateo can do that. Your look at the front pages around the world. Lisa, were you bruised from my beard yesterday? We took a yes. It, it, I got a little mark right here, yeah. but I'm, I'm okay. I recovered. Yeah. This is this is. Do you like this? I went to the <laughs> I, like I went to the Grower Barber Shop. This wow. is what I I went to. They gave it. <laughs> it was so difficult. They took a razor out with it, so it was so difficult. I had to shave twice. But thank you to the good people at the Grower Barber Shop. <laughs> Really, it looks really fantastic. <laughs> well, By you know, the way, the poll, a lot of people wanted the, you to lose no, it, so that's, that's so true. Good. It was a mixed effort, but <laughs> the tilt is that both Vet Bill and Mrs. Keene wanted me to keep the beard. Oh, and I just okay. Said, no, I you said, can't do it. I get a call from the Grower Barber yep. Shop. <laughs> Come shave on down. That, shave that. You're no Matt Miller. Shave <laughs> that puppy <laughs> off. What do you got, Lisa? All right. Kids in Florida under the age of 14, they're a little upset. They will no longer be able to have a social yeah, media thank account. thank you. This went through, yeah, Florida, the first state to do this. It's apps like TikTok and Snapchat. 14 and 15 year olds, though, they are allowed to do it, but they will have to get their parents' permission in order to do that. But under 14. So are the Florida not. police going to go in? How do you regulate this? Is, that? Exactly. That How is the you, question. Some How kids do you. This yes. world? TikTok and from, I mean, that's like Nirvana. Yes. Yeah, so they're going to have to go back, TikTok, Snapchat, and see how old some of these kids are, who's got. Per, it, Who? It's going to be. Good luck with that. It's going to be along the companies TikTok, Snapchat, all these companies are going to have to go back and possibly 
accidentally delete some, but the question is if it's going to happen. I mean, this is going to face right. you know backlash and yeah. and constitutional challenges and 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 all that. Plus the realities of the marketplace. I mean, well, you know, whatever the right. parent <laughs> sounds like a parent kind of. You thing. know, some kids down there on a trip with somebody from Bloomberg to see McGlone, who's you know, yep. they're on the porch of the Betsy on South Beach, and the kids <laughs> TikToking from the Betsy, and what the the police show up. It's it's going to be a long road. Let's okay. just put what it else? that way. It's the first Next. step. <laughs> Let's just okay. put it that way. The first step. Um, okay, so we're going to the Wall Street Journal. You know how Mark Zuckerberg's known? He was known for wearing the hoodies and the shower slides and that whole yeah. casual yeah. kind of look. Yep. Well, maybe he's doing a little middle-aged makeover. He's, it's a new Zuckerberg. He's wearing... He's been seen wearing suits and a shirling jacket, you know, different cardigans. So he's the stepping out. up. The, the hoodies are out. He's stepping up his look. I don't know if it's a middle age thing, but there's also, you know, scrutiny for the industry, the tech industry. You well, know? He's so maybe the, he's sharpening up the image. As according to Rich Go on the Bloomberg Terminal, the fourth wealthiest person Ooh. on the planet, $178.5 billion. So oh. he can afford to upgrade the wardrobe. He can a afford bit. a suit, okay. yes. Or you can get a hoodie from Dior hoodie. or Celine or, you know, I mean, can you imagine? I don't even know what they cost, but can you imagine? Oh, ridiculous. And, and well, by the way, in terms of the uh, increase year to date in the net worth on Richco, he is number one, up $50 billion oh, no this year. It's been I, a good year so I, far. I saw, I'm not going to wow. mention the mutual fund. It doesn't matter, but their number one holding is Meta, Facebook. And it's gone up so much, it's gone from 11% of the portfolio to 14% of the yep. portfolio. That's ridiculous. Paul and I that never, is. this has never happened, Lisa, in most of my life. I mean, it's original. What else do you have to uh, So you know how we always talk about how leases in the city are really expensive for a lot of retailers? Not if you are Kim Kardashian. No. Yes, yeah, she's getting a big lease discount. She has a skim store coming to New York City. She is leasing a 20,000 square foot space right along Fifth Avenue in the heart of New York City for at least seven. 75% less than what was paid by the last tenant, Versace. This is from the New York Post. That's what they're saying. So if you break it down, Skims paid less than $200 per square foot for the lot, whereas Versace paid about $770 per square foot isn't for that, that. I mean, seriously, this is the, I, I've noticed this just in the last couple of days. Uh, let me make it clear. Paris does not have the empty stores mm. in their prime no. area. No, okay. we, They have some selected yep. ones, but Paris doesn't look like a ghost town. Paul, parts of Midtown. Oh, parts sure. of Midtown. Here look like a ghost town. And Tom, this is 647 Fifth Avenue, right near East 52nd yeah. Street. This is an iconic retail, luxury retail address yeah. uh, on Fifth Avenue. So, um, But isn't this solution it's just to lower rents? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I get the taxes go down and all that, but... Basically, she got a good deal. Yep. She got a very good okay. deal. Are, are you done, or is there one more? <laughs> one more. This Thank is you. breaking. Yes, McDonald's bringing Krispy Kreme donuts. They are coming to McDonald's. Wow. Yes. Is that a sign of <laughs> desperation? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? They want to get more breakfast people. They want to get more of those, you know, all-day snackers. Um, Krispy Kreme shares actually up about 14% right now wow. on this wow. news. If that gain holds, Krispy Kreme will be set for its biggest rise since December of 2021. So this is big news for Krispy Kreme. McDonald's still a little bit lower with their shares. But big news for Krispy Kreme. It could happen by the end of the year. Nationwide rolled out, rollout by the end okay. of 2026. A, a girl like you, I'm sure, has her faith. It's not <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. It's not Krispy Kreme. Is there is there like a local donut that you think is... Oh, Duck Donuts. That's another one. Duck that's Donuts? Another, yes, that's duck a big donuts, one in New Jersey. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they make them right there. You could watch it. I, I'm, I'm forever Dunkin' Donuts. They, they took away my favorite, but, you know, it's it's not Krispy Kreme. Well, Krispy, I, I, there will be three of them. You have the original glaze, chocolate ice with the sprinkles, and the chocolate ice cream filled. All there. They're going to be there. Ken, what do you think? Let's go to our global technical director, Ken. <laughs> Thumbs Fellier. up. Ken, what do you think? You know, like, uh, Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts? You know? Oh, Krispy Kreme. There we wow, go. That was both. definitive. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. definitive, and he's the baker. Thank you so much, Lisa Mateo. On a tough day, a little lightness there with... Uh, our, our news report. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.